Speaking about Aqidah, we will continue, inshallah. So the three major components of Aqidah, namely Tawheed, which is the belief in the oneness of Allah, and then Risala, which culminates in believing in the Prophet ﷺ as being the last messenger, and then the Akhirah, which is belief in the afterlife hereafter. All of these three components are then studied in the, uh, as separate disciplines. So you have the issue of the divine, the divinity. You have the issue of the Prophet Sallallahu his life, his role, his mission. And also the issue of eschatology, end of life, end of time, after death, and the day of judgment. All of the three become very, very large okay, points of discussion. So I'm going to go through maybe one or two today, just for the sake of uh, brevity and also for the sake of introducing idea of Aqidah studies. So when we say belief in the oneness of Allah, and this is discussing Allah and his names and attributes, what does a Muslim need to know in order to protect his Iman about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Who is he and what does the Quran say about him? What does the Sunnah say about him and what do Muslims believe about him that enables a Muslim to speak about him with authority? So there are many ayat in the Quran that speak about Tawheed, speak about the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that one of the main missions and functions of a Nabi of a Rasul is to assist human beings in their belief in Allah vis-a-vis their ibadah, how to worship Him and when to worship Him. So the Aqidah of Tawheed is very closely related to the understanding of ibadah worship. We believe in one Allah, one God, one being, the supreme being, and that is why we worship him. So the question now is, what does the Quran say about Allah, and what do the Muslims say about Allah that helps us worship him correctly? So we have now two basic frameworks, concepts, which we use in order to identify the truth about Allah and the falsehood. No Muslim will ever say that there are two gods or three gods. I think that's a given, right? Nobody will say that. And remain a Muslim. Every Muslim believes Allah is one, and the supreme being is one, the creator of the universe is one. In fact. Uh, there are some Arab tribes during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu who also believed uh, that uh, God is one, the supreme creator of the universe is one. So the mission and the message of the Prophet Sallallahu was that you believe that Allah is the macro creator of the universe, but you will not engage him, nor will you engage his names and attributes in your micro affairs the universe. So you will say that God created the universe and that was it and that he has no attachment with or to or link with or to daily life. So in order for you to access now that force and power in the universe you have carved 
uh, made these idols and you know given idols different names so in the haram there are 360 idols and each idol represented a certain force or power and they would now call upon those idols for whatever they represented in their minds so if they needed now food or risk uh, they would call and invoke the name of that idol and if they wanted fertility and children they would invoke the name of that idol and if they wanted now security on their travel they would invoke that idol so all the divine powers were now distributed according to them into these deities and figurines and stones and idols and statues and they would go and worship them and seek assistance from them which is obviously shirk so the <laughs> prophet sarsan's mission was to say no you don't need these icons in order to attract divine attention you need to worship Allah alone as an abstract supreme human being and he has beautiful names so the Quran says وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ husna but the whole will be her so Allah has many beautiful names so if you want a risk then you invoke him but you invoke his name Razak and if you want assistance and help you invoke him, but you say, Ya Nasir, Ya Aziz. And if you want now Aman, peace and security, then you invoke him, the same being. And you say, Ya Salam. So Allah has many names, but he is the same being. He's the same being. So the being doesn't change because he has different uh, now uh, attributes and different names. So that was the mission of the Prophet Sallallahu in <coughs> Mecca and later on in some other places. So the Quraysh could not understand how all of these powers would reside and exist in one being. Are you going to make all the gods into one god? So they found this to be amazing, very strange, that one being would be able to do so much. And so usually one being only has one task and one job, but the multiplicity of tasks and chores and uh, powers was unheard of in the Arabian Peninsula, and that's why they did the shirk. So based off this, the ulama of Kalab and Aqida have uh, now conceptualized Allah by two institutions. One is called the institution, the concept, the theory of Tanzi. Tanzi. What is Tanzi? I'll explain it. And the other is the concept and the theory of Tashbih, which is what we will also explain. So there are, there are two aspects of the same being. What is tanzi? Tanzi is to remove uh, any deficiency and uh, any blame and any disability from Allah's being, His names and attributes. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one, He's alone, He's unique. And any idea, concept, or a theory uh, that now dilutes this being and uh, discredits Him makes him blameworthy or renders, renders him incapable of doing anything at will okay, that is to be nullified and disregarded so when we say the word subhanallah for instance what are we saying the word subhanallah means that we are removing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from every defect from every deficiency Allah is capable of doing everything. Subhanallah. This is the weight behind the word. It's the word everywhere says subhanallah. But the meaning behind the word is very heavy, meaning that when we say Allah, He is devoid of any deficiency, 
and any disability and any blame, any tarnish, any blemish on his being, on his existence. So this is called the theory of tash, Tanzi. Yeah. So in this theory of Tanzi, we have now Surya Khlas. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٌ اللَّهُ الصَّمَدٌ لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدٌ Saying that he is Allah, he is one alone. He has, if he was two, then that would be uh, a disadvantage. Okay. So Allah is independent of everything. Everything is dependent on him, Allah is Samad. If he was dependent, then that would be a disability. Okay, that would be a deficiency. لم يلد ولم يولد Neither has he conceived nor was he conceived. Had he done so, that would have been a dependency that he needs a child or the child needs a father or intellectual conception that neither is he conceived intellectually nor does he allow anyone else to conceive him he is devoid of that he doesn't need people to now conceive him intellectually in order for them to worship there's nothing comparable there's no contrast okay, there's no comparison and uh, there is no antipos to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the one alone unique to stand for them. So this is all tanzi. Yeah, Surah Ikhlas is all about tanzi, that you removed Allah from every and any deficiency and any and every disability. And you keep him the way he has always been, one and alone and unique. So this is the first one. The second one is tashbih. Tashbih is to affirm and confirm any attribute that Allah mentions about himself. Right? So if Allah mentions something about him, then we will confirm that, not because we understand it, but because the Qur'an says so, or because wahi says so. Right? So our aqidah is based on wahi, not on aqal, which is understanding. Okay? So if Allah says, uh, Allah's hand is above their hand. Then we believe in tashbih and we say Allah has a hand. But at the same time we believe in tanzih which means his hand is not like ours. His hand is not created. His hand is the way it is appropriate for him and only he knows what kind of hand he has and we're not allowed to think about it. But we accept that he has one. Right? So Allah says he has eyes in the Quran. Fasbir fa'innaka bi'a'ayunina That you are in front of our eyes. So the Quran says Allah has eyes. So the Sunni said if Allah says he has eyes then he has eyes. Now it is not appropriate for the creation to ask what kind of eyes. Then you bring in tanzi. Okay, the theory of Tanzi and say you remove him from deficiency and disability and dependency. That if you say that his eyes are like ours, then there's comparison. Okay. Or there's a, a dependency on a human form, a figure, a body, okay, and everything else. So we use both Tanzi and Tashbi to now believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So whatever is uh, now undermining Allah's abilities, His oneness, His uniqueness, we negate. And whatever Allah has confirmed as part of Him and part of His reality, we affirm as tashbih. So these two went hand in hand. And uh, Muslims and Sunni Muslims didn't have an issue with that. And that is where you see now the benefit of this aqidah and approach, that when you are going to talk with people, about your understanding of Allah, you know, your concept of your aqeel of Allah, then you know the parameters and you know how far you can go and where you cannot go. So it's very simple. The Sahaba understood this and the Ta'abiyun understood this and then later on people came in during the time of the latter part of the Sahaba's time and the Ta'abiyun definitely where they started to argue about this aqeel. So arguing about the aqidah became a bid'ah, and people started discussing, and then the long history of now defending the true aqidah is now something that's part of this history. Okay. But this is how we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has names and attributes. So
So in those names and those attributes, there are uh, names that contradict each other. Right? One name is what? Anhadi. He is the guide. And the other name is Al Mudil, the one who misguides. Right? They're apparently contradictory. So he says, part of Aqidah, we have to affirm what he has said about himself. So if he guides, then he's a guide. And if he misguides, then he misguides. We never had a problem issue with it. Believing in the contradictory names and attributes of Allah and the Divine was never an issue for the Muslim Ummah. So he is Kareem, he is generous, he's noble. He's Rahim and Ghafoor, very merciful and compassionate and forgiving. But at the same time, one of his names is what? Azizun Duntiqam, Jabbar al Qahar, overwhelming, dominant, and he is uh, someone who can punish and does punish. So these are opposing, and diametrically opposing, and also contradictory names. So now, we never had an issue believing Allah his ability to forgive and Allah his ability to punish we didn't have that issue because why? we believed in danzi and tasbih why do we believe Allah has the ability to punish? because he says so and why do we believe Allah has the ability to forgive? because he says so so it's based on Wahi, not based on our understanding of Aqal. So we didn't entertain Aqal when it came to Allah. Allah is beyond our Aqal and beyond our rationale and beyond our imagination, beyond our con conception, and so on. So we never had a problem with it. Really. Nowadays, unfortunately, if you were to say this to certain Muslim groups or uh, non Muslims especially, you know, how come God is merciful but He allows all these tragedies in the world to happen. And how do you believe and how do you justify hell in your religious construct, in your aqeelah? You can understand heaven, paradise, and jannah, but what about hell? That means that God is now vindictive. So Muslims never had a problem believing in Allah the way he has described himself. Right? Why? Because our aqeelah is always wahi-based. And wahi is supra-rational. Okay? It's supra-rational, it is beyond intellect. So we maintain that premise. So we don't argue when the Qur'an or Sunnah says something about Allah. We take it on face value and we don't uh, differentiate and we do not necessarily discuss unless it's for the sake of post aqidah clarification not pre aqidah debate. So you cannot debate about it if you don't believe in it. You may discuss after you've believed. So that was, that was the, the rule. So nowadays people will say, oh, as I just mentioned that, you know, God is so merciful and why all these calamities and tragedies and disasters in the world and blah, blah, blah. You know? I'm sure you've been there, done that. And you've heard this, and maybe you have had answers, maybe you haven't, it doesn't matter. But this is our aqidah. So the aqidah is whatever Allah says about Himself, we believe on face value. And whatever Allah negates for Himself, we negate, which is tanzi. And whatever Allah affirms for Himself, we affirm, and that is tashbih. So tanzi and tashbih. So whether they, the names and attributes make sense to us, whether they don't make sense, we are obligated and obliged to believe that that is our aqeedah. And that is the way that Tawheed was represented by the Sahaba and so on. On the other side, this is now theoretical and also something that you can put in the back of your mind. The other part of aqeedah is to actually engage in uh, invoking Allah's names and attributes for daily needs. Uh, I have a need, and I need this to happen. So how do I do this? That's called worship. That's called worship. 
Ustiana and Ibada both. Yakana Mudu, Yakana Sain, we have Ibada and Ustiana. So, how do I access Allah's love, uh, potential, and His names and attributes and His powers so that they come upon me on a daily basis and they help me <coughs> live my life the way I'm supposed to? That is through the dhikr of Allah, and that is through dua. And that is through the process of you know, other issues, as we find amongst the shiur. Mm -hmm. So that is something the Prophet ﷺ came to teach also. And he taught the Sahaba du'as, as some of the Sahaba used to say. That the Prophet ﷺ used to teach us du'as, daily du'as, as uh, some of you teach your children the Qur'an. Just as we teach our children how to read and memorize the Quran, the Sahaba say the Prophet used to teach us these du'as. So we memorize those du'as, meaning how to access Allah's names and attributes at the time of need. Because remember, the myth of the idols was killed, right? Before they would go to the idols for assistance, microscopic, managing their daily affairs kind of assistance. So Allah says, you don't need that because I'm here. So now, how do you do that? So the Prophet ﷺ showed the Sahaba how to engage in dua for their needs on a daily basis. And that was through ibadah and that was through isti'ana. And that comes through the process of dhikr and uh, duas and that institution. Okay, through the shuyukh of the tariqa and those who are not from the tariqa also may have access to this. So this is part of the Tawheed discussion. It is necessary so that you get both parts. One is the true now Aqeedah and the other is the application of the Aqeedah. Okay. So the Aqeedah is now primary and the application of the Aqeedah is subsequent to that primary Aqeedah so that you live Tawheed within your life. So now the Sahaba went through life and they faced many problems, many obstacles, many challenges. How did they overcome them? Through dua, through dhikr, through Allah. And that's what Allah is there for, right? So in your salat, you worship Allah. And then out, outside of your salat, you have salat al haja. Outside of your salat al haja, you have your duas, you have your dhikr, you have everything else. So the Sahaba masters of that. And then Ta'abin also now followed with that mastery. And they were able to overcome all the obstacles and challenges that were thrown at them without interfering, without uh, like I say, de derailing their aqidah. Okay. So the, the, the key is not to derail your aqidah when you're seeking assistance from the divine. Mm -hmm. If you derail your aqidah in the process, then you have committed kufr or shirk. And that is where fiqh has to be correct. So the understanding of fiqh becomes also paramount in this discussion. When can you ask Allah? How can you ask Him? And what are the ways you cannot ask Him? And so on. So that also has to be determined, which the Prophet ﷺ did, and the Sahaba did, and then the Ta'liyun, as you know, that they verify it, and they documented all of that. So this is in a kind of synopsis of what we might discuss in an Aqeedah course on the Divine, okay, which is about 15 lessons. This is a brief overview and summary of what, what we might be discussing. Okay. So before we go on to the next, inshallah, summary, we can stop here to the question. Understanding the names of Allah as certain as the different names of Allah as separate entities, just the way for each religion came to the light? Yeah, they said that Allah comes down from the heavens and then these idols they 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 trap okay, the power of that name. So instead of asking Allah who is above the heavens, you ask this 
idol. So they are worshipping Allah, but they are worshipping the form with it. So the the shirk, strictly speaking, is when somebody work, uh, worships the, the form with it. Because if we call Allah through some of the names, I, I, I would call Allah by his attributes of mercy, but I would not call him personally <laughs> through his uh, names of uh, wrath. <coughs> no, so but that doesn't mean that uh, uh, these names become like idols. The names, as long as there's no, as long as there's things. no form, mm -hmm. either conceptually or in reality, in physical form, mm -hmm. then you're fine. So even conceptually, you can't imagine a form of Allah, his name that is, or a color. <laughs> or when the color is green, then he is merciful. And when the color is red or orange, he's not merciful. So you have to make sure that the mind does not attract any kind of concept. The shirk is in the form. Prescribed, um, you know, like sometimes you go to a certain a sheikh will give you to say, you know, say this name and and have you know for this number of times say this mm -hmm. name. You know, so a prescription. Is that something that has been passed down um, from, you know, through through a line? Is that on the tariqa? Yes, yes. There are many ways to invoke Allah, His name, His attributes, and people have experimented and experienced different ways by which that is possible. But the concept is correct. There are many hadith in which the Prophet said, read this formula, la hawla quwwata illa billahi ali azim. A hundred times the hadith in which the Prophet said, read subhanallah 33 times, alhamdulillah 33 times, Allahu Akbar 34 times. And there are many formulae in which the Prophet asks, and whoever says, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, three times in the morning, three times in the evening, he will not be harmed by anything except death. And so on. So many a hadith will speak about the concept. So the concept is fine, there's nothing wrong with the concept. It's perfectly in line with the Sunnah. What I'm saying is that the understanding of du'as and azkar is part of Tawheed, is not alien from Tawheed. It's part of the same discussion. And the early ulama and scholars, they were well versed with both. The theory, aqidah of Tawheed and also the practice of Question this. If, if there is a dua that is uh, that is reached us from the Prophet, uh, is it better to use that one instead of using our own worldly Quran? Well, you can make dua in any language, and if there is a dua of the Prophet, then obviously that is better. But if somebody has prescribed something else for you, that's fine. Too. Du'as in the Quran, uh, what do they call the Masmun du'in, that they consider to be the highest form? Yes, du'as of the Quran are there. And these are the du'as that Allah wants you to ask. So we must ask those du'as. So the next component to Aqeedah is about the Prophet ﷺ and all Prophets. So the basic framework there is to appreciate and to believe that Allah Taala does speak to human beings. Allah does communicate with human beings. 
So in the minds of many people, uh, you have uh, various questions about the divine speaking to the non-divine. How do we know this is what God wants? This is a very common question. And uh, how do you know that God only speaks to these people? And if I or someone else claim that uh, God spoke to me, then why are you depriving me from doing what God wants me to do? Alright, here's a question. So the question is, does Allah speak to human beings? Does he communicate with human beings? And the answer is yes. Then the second question, which human beings does he communicate with? So Muslims say that the human beings with whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala communicates, they are known as Al-Anbiya wa Rusul The Prophets and the Messengers And outside of those human beings Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not communicate To human beings So Allah definitely does communicate And whomever he chooses to communicate with Becomes a Nabi and or a Rasul if Allah wants him to now communicate further to other human beings. So when Allah tells Nuh salam, tell your people this and that. So Allah is communicating with the Nuh and he is ordering, instructing Nuh to further communicate. That's known as Tabliq. So that is wahi. That is what? Wahi. So that is when that person becomes a Nabi. If Allah communicates with someone but does not instruct him to communicate further, then that is not Nabuwa. It may be a form of wahi. But it's not Nabuwa. For example, the Quran says about the mother of Musa Islam, wa awhayna ila umm Musa an ardi that we revealed to the mother of Musa that she should suckle him and feed him. So the Quran uses the word wahi for whom? For the mother of Musa Islam. But do we say that Musa Islam's mother was a Nabi? No. Why? Because Allah did not ask her to do what? Communicate further. That would have been what? Counterproductive. <laughs> she wasn't going to go run into the bazaar and the silk. Hey, guess what God told me to do today? <laughs> that would have been killing Musa. Does that make sense? Yes. So it is possible that Wahi comes to an individual, but that individual is not a Nabi. So which individual is a Nabi? Someone who receives communication from Allah and then Allah instructs him further do what? Communicate to others. And then that will be a Nabi. The Maryam alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Jibreel to her, right? So Allah communicated through Jibreel to Maryam and then she conceived Isa alayhi salam. But did Allah instruct Maryam now to communicate to the whole world? In fact, she was told to do what? Be quiet. And say, فَلَنْ أُكَلِّمَ الْيَوْمَ in I will never speak to a man today. I'm not going to speak to a human being today. Okay? So Allah communicated through Jibreel to Maryam, but that did not make her a Nabi. Even though Jibreel came and Wahi came. You understand my point? So there are individuals who are mentioned in the Quran who received communication from Allah, but they are not Nabi. Who is a Nabi? Someone who receives communication, then is instructed to 
inform others about his communication. And that is a Nabi. So anyone who is of this nature and uh, this caliber then goes on further and then practices the Sharia of the time, the law of the time. Any Nabi who is given a different Sharia, a reformed Sharia, is called a Rasul. So a Rasul is already a Nabi who receives now amendments in the Sharia. Okay. Reformed Sharia. He is called a Rasul, so he is now a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with regards to daily practice. Uh, so this is what Allah wants you to do about this, and this is what Allah wants you to do. So he is now the lawgiver. He is the lawgiver. So this is the framework within which we understand Nabuwa and Risala, prophethood and apostleship. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala communicates with human beings who are instructed to communicate the word of Allah, the word of God to other human beings. And they show people how to behave and practice law. And that is how we understand this part and this component of Aqiyah. So there are thousands of prophets and the most necessary feature of this is to believe that Muhammad وسلم, is the last of all messengers. And that there will be no person receiving Nabuwa after him. And there will be no one receiving Wahi after the Prophet. So whatever was meant to be delivered was delivered by the Prophet. At the time of Hajjat al Rida, when he asked the Sahaba, that, Have I not delivered? And they said, Yes, not only have you delivered, but you've done much more than that. So, this is how we see Tabligh. This is what? Tabligh, delivering the message. Tabligh is to convey the message. So, all prophets came to convey and deliver the message, and the Prophet Muhammad. Came and delivered the last message after which there is no wahi, after which there is no nabuwa. So that is our aqidah about this component, and I'm sure all of you know this already, okay. but you have to do it in the framework, present it in the framework. And the validity of this, obviously, the impact of this is that anyone who claims to be a nabi or a prophet after Rasulullah وسلم, is a fraud. He's a liar. Like during the time of the Prophet وسلم, there was Musaylamah al Qaddab. So he claimed to be a Nabi. So the Sahaba went and they fought him and they killed him. And then with Musaylamah, there was another lady. She also claimed. And then afterward, there are many people who claimed Nabuwa. And prophethood after Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi So we say in the Sunni aqidah that Nabuwa has been now uh, has climatized with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, culminated there, and no one else can be a Nabi. So no one else is infallible after the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He is the last person, and that is the aqidah. After Rasulullah sallam, there were very, very, very pious people known as the Sahaba, but we believe that they are not infallible. They are great people, and we will not say anything about them because of wahi. They may or may not have mistake, made mistakes, but we won't say anything about them. Why? Because we can't. The reason we do not criticize the Sahaba is because of our aqidah. We're not allowed to. Okay, not because we believe they are what? Infallible. There's a difference, right? So the discipline comes from wahi. So, who was right and wrong? One person was right and the other was wrong. Can we say anything about it? No. Why? That is not what he said. The Prophet said this to the Sahaba, and the Sahaba reported this to us. So we cannot be critics of the Sahaba. We have to remain quiet. That is the adab, so that is the discipline. But it's not framed in the discussion of infallibility. 
Who is infallible? All the prophets. Anyone who is not a prophet is fallible. Then why don't you say anything against Sahaba? Because we're not allowed to. The fiqh doesn't allow us. The fiqh doesn't allow us to say anything against the Sahaba or his Ali and Ali. That is the Sunni Aqeedah. Those who want to discuss the mistakes and the faults or sins of the Sahaba, they are not from this Aqeedah. They are from another Aqeedah. And that is the bottom line. After that, there are many people who are pious, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has favored them with knowledge and ma'rifah and gnosis and realization, recognition and good deeds and good works, mashallah, but they are not prophets, nor are they the Sahaba. Yeah. And that is the order we have. That is our aqeerah, that the Risala Nabuwa is restricted to those human beings who received wahi from Allah, and then they were ordered to transmit that wahi forward to other human beings. And after that, uh, there are levels of piety. So, so what is the highest level of piety? Nabuwa. Nabuwa is the highest level of piety. After that, what is the highest level of piety? Suhba with the Prophet Then after that, those who came after them. The Tabi'un and those who followed the Tabi'un. So this is an order of now piety in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you are going to discuss the Prophets, you cannot discuss anything about the Prophets in such a way that lends itself to believing that they were impious. So when you discuss the, the Prophets in the Qur'an, and the Qur'an mentions certain discretions about a Nabi, then you report what happened and what the Qur'an says. You don't critique it. So if Adam السلام, he tasted the forbidden fruit in Jannah, that's all you say. You don't go into off on a tangent and you start critic. He made a mistake, he made a blunder, he made a sin. Uh, when Yunus السلام, left his people without the final idhan from Allah, you report it. You don't psychoanalyze it, nor do you critique it. You say, that's it, that's all the Quran says. So we are asked to report what the Qur'an says. We are not allowed to critique it and say, see, this one, he also made a mistake and sin, therefore they were human beings. So that is the wrong framework. What is the right framework? That Allah reports whatever happened the way it happened, and we believe it happened the way it happened without going into the details. So this is So the discipline comes from Wahi. Those who seek to now critique those incidents in the Quran or in the Seerah about the Prophets and the Sahaba without uh, applying the fiqh, then they are guilty of sin. So before you say that the Prophets committed sin, you already committed a sin. For what? For discussing it that way. Right? So the, the Sahaba are very careful. The Sahaba understood the stories of the Quran, but none of the Sahaba ever reportedly said, Ah, see, this one he committed a sin, this one he committed a sin. Likewise, the Tabi'un, who were the students of the Sahaba, do you not think they knew who Ali and Muawiyah were? Of course, they lived there. They lived the disputes, right? You, you have now the Arab Spring and you have the Syrian experience and you have every day of the experience in the contemporary world and is it for someone to say after you, 20 years after you, that how can you talk about that? It's, well, I was there. I lived it. So now you, you, you cannot blame the Tabi'in for saying that you should not discuss what happened between Ali and Muawiyah. Why? They were there. We saw what happened, but we're not allowed to discuss it because that's part of our aqeedah. Yeah, that's part of it. 
they were witnesses to whatever happened between the two parties. But they never reported their comments and their critique to their students and say, this is the way you should critique it. They stopped. Why? Because this would have been the first chain of disunity in the Ummah. That once you start criticizing those who come before you, then those who come after you will do the same to you. And it will be an endless domino effect where you will start cursing each other. One after another, you start cursing each other. So the Tabi'un said, enough. And the Sahaba said, we won't discuss the topics. We'll just report what the Quran says. So we have to be careful that we uh, do not bask in the glory of being objective. <laughs> it's nothing very objective. It's about being Muslim. You submit. Mm. You submit to the will of Allah. So when Adam salam, he now ate from the fruit forbidden tree, then we what? We submit to Allah's will. What is the benefit of that? The benefit of that is that we exist. If Adam didn't taste the fruit then, would we be here? What do you think? If Adam didn't taste the fruit, then he'd still be in Jannah. Is that true? Then would we be here? No, we wouldn't We wouldn't be here. We wouldn't exist, never mind. We wouldn't exist. So before you start saying Adam committed a mistake, you have to be careful. His mistake is what produced you. <laughs> right? Yeah, meaning his mistake was a rahmah. And whenever your mistake is a rahmah, you can imagine what your good deeds are. <laughs> so before you discuss their mistakes, discuss their good deeds. Yeah. That's Allah's will. You submit to Allah's. Will Allah's will is supreme. So likewise with all the Anbiya that are mentioned in the Quran, there is always more than a silver lining to what they did. They produced Rahmah. Yunus salam, left his people. What did that do for his people? When he left, then Allah subhanahu's punishment was above them. But because he left, Allah removed and lifted the punishment. And then when he came back, the same people did what? Except Islam. So when you make a mistake that now converts 100,000 people, is that a mistake or is that a rahmah? <coughs> so why are you discussing that as a mistake? So we must be careful. Likewise, the effects of whatever the Sahaba did with themselves, among themselves, has huge implications on the Ummah. And the Tabi'un knew that and they saw that because they lived it and didn't say it. And what was that? It's not part of this discussion, but since I've opened the door. <laughs> what is the benefit of not discussing the difference between Ali and Maria? What is the benefit? The benefit is that you don't call each other kafir. What's the benefit? You don't call each other kafir for what? Disagreeing about political issues. Right? They had a political difference. Did they have a difference in deen? They had a political difference. So now the Tabi'un said, if we say this was right and this is wrong, then the people who will come after us will say, well, maybe because he was a kafir, and maybe because he was a Muslim. So what the Tabi'un did was that they protected the Ummah from institutionalizing takfir, condemning each other's kafirs. You understand what I'm saying? So because the Tabi'un didn't say anything about the Sahaba, those who followed them didn't say anything about them, and those who followed them didn't say anything about them until recently. It's a modern day phenomenon. <laughs> modern day phenomenon and bidah is what? You call everybody kafir. Which akhidah is that? That's a shaitani akhidah. That's his shaitan. You're calling every Muslim on the planet the kafir because they don't agree with you. That's not found neither in the Sahaba, nor in the Tabi, nor in the four Imams. That everybody who disagrees with you, all of a sudden, he's a kafir. 
So what did the Tabi'un teach us? They taught us this discipline that yes, are as great as the Sahaba were, and as much as they fought with each other, we will not say anyone is right or wrong, because this will open the doors of excommunication and takfir. That's the benefit. So now that produces rahmah. What, which rahmah? That we kept the whole ummah together. That is called unifying the ummah. Right? So if you want to be objective about it, then you have to remain quiet. This is our khilah. This is our discipline. So it comes under Risal and Nabuha discussion. Just as there's a footnote to the whole issue, inshallah. There are many other discussions within this realm. Again, it's another 15 lecture kind of series. Just this discussion on Nabu al Risala and the details of this. But we'll stop here for this component, inshallah. Any questions? No. Ajit, in regard to the idea of critiquing an event in the history, indirectly, in so, in so critiquing, isn't it also as if that you have uh, questioned an action of God? Is there a link between uh, God the actor of the event that is part of the aqidah, and in so knowing and trying to you know open it up to this this type of yes. the situation of Rahman in it, you do not. Yes, no doubt. With, with the prophets, yes. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he favors the prophets and he guides them to whatever he guides them. So they may be apparent mistakes, but it's the way he wants them. So with the prophets, you can make that statement. You cannot make that statement with the non prophets Any other questions? The final component to this is now three part Aqeelah. The Tawheed, Risala is Akhirah. Akhirah means the end of time and the day of judgment, which is a huge, huge field in and of itself. And people have written volumes on it. There's so much detail in the Quran Hadith about the Day of Judgment. Right. So as, as a framework, it's very simple. What we do is that we say that the, when the sur or the trumpet, the horn is blown on the Day of Judgment, then you must understand what happens before it, what happens during <coughs> that time, and what happens after it. So the before, the during, huh? In the aftermath, <coughs> meaning this, in the resurrection. So, what happens before the day of judgment, that's known as the Ashurat al and the signs of the day of judgment. So, the Prophet and in a certain passages of the Quran, there are details of some of these signs. So what are the signs of the Day of Judgment? Known as Ashrat al-Sa'a and Alamat al-Sa'a and so on. So most of you know of this, mashallah, the coming of the Yajuj and Majuj and the coming of the Dajjal and the return of the Isa salam. These are all very big signs before the Day of Judgment occurs. So we, we understand those in this framework that they came to represent the end of time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a plan and in that divine plan the universe will, will be destroyed. So what will herald that destruction? <coughs> so some of the signs, if not most of the signs, are destructive and immoral. So the Prophet also mentioned that when uh, immorality becomes rampant and zina becomes rampant and all of these issues. Mm -hmm. And then other issues are when earthquakes become rampant. Okay, so that there, there, there's a natural progression 
if we're gravitating towards destruction of the, the universe and the world. Yeah. Then there are other signs that the Quran also must speak of, which is a whole category. And uh, the scholars have enumerated all of these signs, and they've written books on this. So when you have those details in front of you, you know where to categorize and where to place them. Some are geographic and uh, geological, some are moral, okay, and some are physical, some are metaphysical, and some are apparent and some are hidden. But uh, every in our understanding of eschatology, uh, whether it's in this religion or any other religion, will be mostly the same. Okay, so the biblical references to the signs of the Day of Judgment are very similar to those references given in the Quran. So so you might find they overlap, if not they're very similar. Okay. So that's how we see that. So there's no doubt in that. In fact, that, they, that came from Wahi, that the prophets, alayhi salam, they mentioned this to all of their people so that people would uh, appreciate and realize the enormity of those signs and you know, behave and reform and repent. So the reason we study those signs is not to marvel at them, but to repent, <laughs> to reform. Well, now Muslims, when they see some of these signs, uh, they just marvel. Oh, the Prophet saw some say, at the end of time this will happen. Then that's not the reason he told you that. The reason he told you that was to repent and be alert that you have to mend your ways and you have to now uh, seek Allah's forgiveness. And so, on. so those are signs in the first phase, or the before phase. So as all of this is happening, then the sword or the trumpet is going to be blown, and Israel Islam, when he blows the, trump, the trumpet, there will be uh, this uh, now catastrophic, universal kind of uh, destruction of everything, where the sun and the moon will collide together, and there will be a major eclipse, celestial eclipse, and the, the, the stars will lose their light, and on earth, the earth will shake from all corners and the sea will open apart where now you see the core of the earth and all the fire will come up and all of these good signs you know? all bad signs as we like to say you know? right? so that will be heralded by the sun coming out from the west which as you know today that means what the, the, the earth will start to spin the other way so when the earth starts to spin the other way, then you know the day of judgment is upon you. So the Quran mentions these details: Al Qariya, Al Qariya, and Surah Al Zilzila, the Awwal Zalaha. All of these surahs that speak about this phenomenon that is the day of judgment, Ida Waqat Al Waqiya, Laysa Al Qatil Hakadila, and so on. So those signs are mentioned in the Quran and Sunnah, and it is for the student of knowledge to read those signs in the Quran and Sunnah and then place them where they belong and obviously you want to seek refuge in Allah from being alive at that time. You don't want to be alive at that time. You want to make sure you're far away from that. Because after the uh, the Jal is destroyed by Isa alayhi salam and Isa alayhi salam rules the world uh, and there's peace and justice for 40 years after which the uh, Yajur Maju will come out and they'll destroy the whole world and so on. There'll be no Muslims left on the planet except few if any and then this time will come that the uh, sun will rise from the west and this will be now the mark that the trumpet has been blown so when that trumpet is blown the earth will spin the other way and the rest will just be history so this is a very scary frightening depiction of uh, the end of the universe in the Quran it's very graphic and we read these surahs and these Ayat so that we develop a sense of taqwa and the fear of God in us. So this is the, the, the during phase. Afterwards, when there's a total decimation, if not eradication of the universe as we know it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whenever he decides, will revive and then ask him for the second coming. Because we don't know how long that is. Now time will become irre irrelevant then. Okay. 
So when time becomes irrelevant and we are resurrected with our physical bodies from the grave, after the second trouble of the Book of Dawn, then you have now the beginning of the last day. The last day is called the last day because it is that. <coughs> there will be no more days after it. And that last day may prolong itself for 50,000 years, some of the scholars say. Okay. It's a huge time period. Okay. So when you're in a place where your life and your waiting period is about 5,000, 10,000, 50,000 years, you can imagine that that environment is very different from this environment. So you're, you're in another phase of life. Okay. So you have this phase of life, and then you have your qabr, which is your barzakh, which is another phase of your life, and then you have a third phase of life, <laughs> life is the day of judgment, which is the last phase. So there you have many details, again in the Quran, Again, the many, many details of what happens on the last day after you're resurrected. And, you know, you have your accountability, you have your hisab, you have your book of deeds given to your right hand, hopefully, inshallah. And then you, you have your, your actions, your scales, uh, where your actions are being weighed and everything's measured. Then you have your social uh, court of justice where you confront each other or you don't, or you vouch for each other or you blame each other for all the wrongs you did to each other, all the rights you did for each other. Okay, that's another phase of that life on the Day of Judgment. Okay. So the Day of Judgment has many phases of life. One, two, three, four. And then you have to cross over the bridge, which goes over hell. And then you, inshallah, will be, will be lucky enough to get over the bridge and they'll be in front of the courtyard of Jannah, the Prophet Sassam and the believers waiting there. And the angels waiting to receive us and then we'll be drinking from the hole of Kohar. And then at the gates of Jannah. So now this whole phase of life after we are resurrected a second time, people unfortunately dismiss as if it was just a minor event. And then it's going to be a long time, brother. <laughs> it's a very long time. You can't wait five minutes now for your internet to start working. <laughs> now you're going to wait 50 years for Allah to start the proceedings. Uh, imagine the suspense and the fright and the, the, the terror okay, and the fear that, that that day will bring upon an amount of kabir, some of them are here. So this is a day worth obviously fearing. Right? This is a day you must fear as the Quran says. Very frightening propositions. So when you study these ayat and these uh, signs of uh, what happens and uh, the events of how they will unfold on the day of judgment, then you know you place everything in its proper place. Okay. So part of that is the shafa of the Prophet but before that, you don't want to be in any position where you need the Shafa of the Prophet Because you'll be going through terrible, terrifying phases and experiences where it will just be, you know, what, uh, what is coming up before hell, literally. Okay. Mm. So that is where the Shafa issue is very real, it's true, no doubt the Prophet will, inshallah, intercede and hopefully he intercedes for us for another reason other than Najat raise our ranks and so on. But when we do speak about Shafa of the Prophet it has to be in its place. You give it its true place. Okay. The, the, the idea is not to fight about it. Will there be Shafa? Will there not be Shafa? The idea is to prepare for it. Okay. Or not to prepare for it. Okay. So that's the idea. Okay. So the, uh, the events of the Day of Judgment the Yom Al-Akhir are those events that will come before someone enters Jannah. Okay. So after that, as you enter Jannah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will gather all the people who are supposed to enter Jannah and then he will bring time and then he will slaughter time. And then he will announce after this, there is no more time. That's why it's called the last day. There will be no more day after that. 
will be in Jannah for eternity, inshallah. So that's it. So the Jannah is there and Jahannam is there underneath. And that's how you see the events on the last day unfolding. So there are many details and many issues discussed. Many hadiths speak about the various details on the last day. So you have the before phase, and you have the during phase, and you have the after phase, which obviously requires many, many discussions, many lectures. After that, you have the details of Jannah in the Quran and Sunnah, and you also have the unfortunate details of Jahannam in the Quran and Sunnah. That's all part of our theme. So all the way from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His eternity and His existence, and all the way to Jannah and Jahannam, you have Aqeedah. So it's a comprehensive understanding of reality the way it is. And that is why Islam's Aqeedah is very comprehensive. It's not something that is haphazard or something that is piecemeal. It's very comprehensive, very holistic, very organized, very methodical. And that's how you study Aqeedah. Any questions on this or anything else? Speaking of placing events in the proper place, mm -hmm. uh, an attempt to place events in the proper place. Yes. Hate to put you on the spot. <laughs> but <laughs> where are we now? Where? Where are we yeah. now? I, I, I don't 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 say uh, Palm de Mirror. <laughs> That's not the answer I'm looking for. <laughs> well we definitely very close to the blowing of the trumpet. Allah knows how close, but we are very close. But, as the Prophet said, there's always hope. And that's why he was the genius of all geniuses. The one hadith that, uh, mashallah, proves to me that he is a Nabi is a hadith in which the Prophet said, obviously, they all prove that he's a Nabi. <laughs> But the one that stands out is this one. That he said, when you see the sun rising from the west and you are planting a tree, then what do you say? Continue planting and finish the job. You don't know how it will benefit others. Even though you don't want to be there when that happens. Right? So here's the uh, Nabi who was filled with hope optimism even at that time so you don't know how long that will take after the sun rises from the west you don't know how long it will take before you know the earth is destroyed so it seems that as that happens there will be enough time for the tree to grow maybe six months maybe a year we don't know said don't stop any good deed that you're doing because of the sign you have to continue doing the good work We make dua, definitely. <coughs> we won't know until we get there. We can hope and make dua. Be here, Mashallah. Give Allah's name and then Mashallah.
speak to say something in this last for us, please? Yeah, please. I'm so really happy with this picture. Hmm? <laughs> so really happy with it. It's history. Yeah. <coughs> um, speaking about the signs of the times and our geographical location we're located at, um, we have to be witnessing these wonders for our sites that we have right now. First Khalifa and the results of the signs of the times. So we see it and I think our natural reaction, our natural um, inclination will be, you know, subhanAllah. But um, these are signs moving towards the end of time. So our natural inclination should be what? You know, he said, um, I think he said, um, reflect, repent, and what, something else? Yeah, reform. You know, there's no doubt that there's signs of the times. That uh, you know, the more good deeds you add, hopefully, the more we're able to delay the process. So, yeah. Yeah. Continue the good work. Try and help people. Help yourself. Yeah. If everybody gives up, then obviously. Is to continue. As I said, planting the tree in the right way. What good is the tree going to do when the earth is going to be destroyed in the next few weeks or six months? There still might be some hope for possibly the tree to bear, um, bear fruit and <coughs> lead people up to the Definitely. Yes. Our actions do either expedite or delay the process. Bad deeds expedite and good deeds delay. So the more people you bring in to the deen and the more people you ask to reform and repent is a better just for the whole of humanity. This is ecology at its best, saving the planet. Is this? You want to be the Green Party and say save the planet, that doesn't work, it just works. You get more people to pray, fast, and give zakat, and go for hajj, and make dua and zikr. That is the only way to save the universe. Obviously, we're not in favor of pollution, but <laughs> the, the, the immoral pollution is much heavier on the planet than the natural pollution. Absolutely. Our diseases are more serious than physical diseases. Time is yours, sir. This should be just about in now. Three forty is one of the sharpest. Three forty two, we have about three forty five. Uh, it's just just now Example. coming in. Yeah. Just now coming in now. So it's in the charge. Another the buy is about four minutes. And the pecan is on about three, four minutes. Why don't we do this and let uh, we'll allow you to pray your <laughs> song? And then we can reconvene if people want to stay. So um, what we're saying is that um, yeah, we're going to break for uh, us and people leave first and, uh, and then we'll come back for people who will have further discussion. So we just in case some people need to leave, we're going to make a dawah. This will be like informal discussion, so we can meet and just kind of informal, I think. Informal, but it will be honoring the request of Sidi Bar and informal is really a good time. Okay. Informal is as well now, I guess. Well, it won't be the whole thing, obviously. Okay. Maybe a framework. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. 
رب اغفر وارحم وانت خير الراحمين رب اغفر وارحم وتجاوز عما تعلم انك انت العزيز الاكرم اللهم اكفنا بحلالك الحرام واغننا من فضلك على سبحانك اللهم انا نسالك الصحه والعافيه والعمانية والأمانة وحسن الخلق والله القدر رب اغفر وارحم وانت خير الراحمين ربنا اغفر لنا ذنوبنا واسرافنا في امرنا وثبت اقدامنا وانصرنا على القوم الكافرين ربنا هب لنا من ازواجنا وذرياتنا قرة اعين واجعلنا للمتقين اماما اللهم انا نسالك رضاك والجنة ونعوذ بك من سخطك والنار ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا غلبنا أنفسنا وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكون من الخاسرين ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم وصلى الله تعالى على خير خلقه محمد وآله وأصحابه المعين برحمتك يا رحمة